Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome, welcome to Vision and Audition. Um, sorry, in case you didn't realise, we were just waiting for a few minutes for other people to join us, um, but we're going to begin now. Um, so today is going to be quite a whistle-stop tour uh, about the eye and the ear. Um, as you probably get that from the title, you are second year med students, you're not children. Uh, we're first going to focus on the eye. Um, it's a huge, huge topic. So just so you have an idea about what's going to go happen, um, I spoke to some of your lecturers and they said sometimes the optics are sort of neglected, um, especially in essay answers. So we're just going to go over that. Um, the, uh, the analysis of acuity, because it brings in quite a lot of concepts um, that you can translate to every single visual essay. Um, and also the pathways and lesions on the pathways and some clinical and experimental um, evidence. Uh, the second half of the essay, uh, second half of the presentation rather, is going to focus on audition. So we're going to crack on with the eye. So voila, here's the structure of the eye. It should be the first figure in every single essay that you do about the vision. It can be very simple. God knows that I'm not an artist myself. Just to quickly run through it, cornea, transparent surface air fluid interface giving the um, refraction power of 42 diopters um, and it's not adjustable. Um, I just see people are waiting in the lobby but I'm sure um, Rosie will sort that out for us. Um, the lens, it's transparent, also offers refraction of 18 diopters, it has no blood supply um, but the aqueous humour of the eye penetrates the lens because the lens is fibrous and through diffusion, it gets its nutrients, okay? Um, the ciliary muscles ex executes the accommodation reflex of the lens. The iris, so the dilation of constriction of which is both concentric and reflexive, it increases the dynamic range of the eye and can increase depth of focus, okay? And two more very key parts of the eye are the choroid, which absorbs excess light. OK, and this prevents reflection back into the eye and blurring of the image. I always used to forget about the choroid um, in my time. So I always try and remember that without a choroid layer, the kind of inside of the eye with all of the reflection of the light would kind of look like a disco ball. And obviously it doesn't. Um, so please remember it. And the fovea. So this is the highest concentration of cones in any position and it's positioned specifically to receive the most direct passage of light. The cones are tapered, hence the name cone, um, in a shape to allow this high density packing, okay? So we've just briefly gone through the structure of the eye. Remember, pretty much this figure is the most basic figure that you want to include, okay? And so physiology, ph physiology of the optic. So what does the eye actually do to help us see? Because we forget in neurology, Firstly, that there are anatomical elements to this and also that these anatomical elements can enhance the neurology. OK, so it actually enables in vision. Um, so the cornea, we've already spoken about its refractive index. So remember, there's two interfaces, the air cornea um, interface and then the cornea anterior chamber interface. OK, and so without the cornea, we would not be able to see it bends the light as light travels through two different densities of substance, and that's diffraction, um, refraction in fact, um, and allows the light to be focused on the back of the retina. So some people have different shaped corneas, and this is called astigmatism. So quite maybe a few of your um, student peers will have this, and this means that they focus horizontal lines at a different focal length from a vertical line and it's tested through astigmatic fans. But it can also be tested or seen, for example, for people with astigmatism looking at light in the darkness, they'll see those weird kind of lines coming off the light, and that's a, a small astigmatism that they can see. OK, so again, the cornea doesn't provide all of the refractive power of the eye. The lens offers a small but very crucial part. So. The thing is that the, the cornea provides the most power, but because the lens is slightly posterior to the cornea, it allows focusing of nearer objects. So you can see that figure in the top right corner. A distant object is really nicely focused by the cornea, 
but the 42 diopters of the cornea doesn't actually provide that focusing power of a nearer object when it's close than nine meters. And this is provided, basically, you can think of it as adding an extra magnifying power, um, although it's not mag magnification we're talking about, it's refraction, but it's that extra kind of lens that you can see um, so that you can see these objects and focus them, okay? So it provides 18 diopters of refraction. So that's 18 plus the 42 of the cornea equals viewing objects at close than nine meters. So the lens doesn't really come up much, but in terms of the um, clinical aspects, you can just mention presbyopia, which is the inability of, to, of the eye to accommodate um, to close objects due to um, decrease of elasticity. So it's not elastin, it's just elasticity. And that's because of a decrease in the composition of the alpha crystalline, um, which allows for this bending of the lens. OK, so the lens and presbyopia is less notable in bright sunlight because the more bright sunlight, the more um, light waves that are coming through and the higher the chance that something's going to focus on the back of the cornea. OK, so we're just moving on from the structure of the eye per se. We're just going to briefly touch on the concept of receptive fields, because although receptive fields like it's very difficult to enter this concept into a lecture, it's going to permeate through every single slide pretty much. So the receptive field of a neuron basically describes the area of the retina for which the light influences the activity of the neuron. So whether we're talking about the optic nerve or an individual neuron in the cortex, they're going to respond every time a light hits that specific part of the retina that they're specific to. OK, so why are receptive fields important? Well, they are functional. They allow for functional interpretation, which sounds a bit silly. But if we go down to the level of a frog, a frog will jump and a small black spot waved in front of it. This stimulus elicits a strong response from the retinal ganglion cells because the frog uses receptive fields to detect the bug. So they don't recognise a bug per se. Frogs don't have that uh, power of recognition and visual processing per se, but they use this receptive field con uh, concept to um, identify food, feed, and therefore not die. Okay. Just to briefly um, outline phototransduction, there's a lot of words on this slide here. This is mostly for you to go back to it, hopefully after you fit, uh, fill out some feedback for me. Um, but so you can go back for it, um, through it in the handout for any essays or just to clarify the steps, um, because these steps sometimes can come, come up in MCQs. So the first thing that happens in vision, the beginning of vision, is that the rhodopsin or iodopsin in the disc membrane of the outer segment absorbs a photon. This changes the configuration of a retinal shift-based cofactor inside the protein from cis to trans, causing the uh, retinal to change shape. This results in a series of unstable intermediates, okay? And the last of these intermediates binds uh, strongest to G protein uh, in the membrane, called transducin and it activates it. Okay, so transducin is now activated. This is the first stage of amplification. So amplification is a concept that we need to discuss briefly, but not focus too much on. But if you think about the size and the stimulation provided by a single photon, which then can lead to an action such as eating or drinking, etc, etc. Or even just think about the net amount of neurons that are activated. Amplification, amplification is going to be an important process to which a stimulus is increased in sort of activity that it provokes. So a single photon activates a single receptor that activates a single cofactor that then leads to X, Y, Z. So it's going to have to be amplifi amplified, the signal, in order to elicit a strong response or any response from a neuron. OK, so. After this amplification step, so each photoactive rhodopsin triggers um, an activation of about 100 transducins at this point, okay, due to this binding of the G protein. So transducin then activates this enzyme, CGMP specific phosphodiesterase, um, which then catalyzes the hydrolysis of CGMP to 5 uh, GMP. This is the second amplification step. 
So a single PDE hydrolyzes about a thousand um, G CGMP molecules. So the net concentration due to this hydrolyzation step of intracellular CGMP is reduced, leading to sodium ions not being able to enter the cell because there's a closure of cyclic nucleotide gated Na plus um, ion channels located in the uh, photoreceptive outer segment membrane. Then this leads to a change in the membrane potential um, difference, and this leads to voltage gated calcium channels to close. There's now less calcium inside the cell, therefore intracellular um, calcium ion concentration is decreased. And this decreased concentration means that less glutamate is then released via calcium dependent exocytosis because there are literally less calcium. So there's less, um, it's less able to trigger this release. So the reduction of this um, glutamate means that one population of bipolar cells will be depolarized and a separate population of bipolar cells will be hyperpolarized, depending on the nature of the receptors at the postsynaptic terminal. OK, so this is all about center on off mapping visual units that we're going to touch on later. But basically what you need to re remember is that photoreceptors release less neurotransmitter when stimulated by light. And this can lead to either stimulation or inhibition of the postsynaptic cell depending on the na nature of that bipolar cell. OK. We just briefly talked about all of this intracellular business and preclinical med school loves this. Not crucial if you don't remember it, don't worry, but it's important to sort of know sometimes there are essays on just this phototransduction, OK, or the translation from external stimulus to intracellular response. So we've already gone over this concept. And so what happens after this transduction? Well, Let's say an action potential is created, either stimulatory or inhibitory, and it travels through the optic canal um, via the optic nerve. At the chiasm, there's incomplete desiccation. And then the fibers then branch and terminate at three different places. Most of them, the crucial one of these three places, if you're not going to remember any others, is the lateral geniculate nucleus, that, which then goes to the primary visual cortex, secondary and tertiary. OK, so. I'm now going to just talk about why this whole chiasm business and this pathway is important. This diagram you're probably very um, familiar with. It's very good to be familiar with. Because of this chiasm and because of we, the defined pathway, we know that certain clinical presentations of visual uh, field loss can directly translate to a specific position of lesion. OK, so let's take for example a lesion of the optic nerve because that's the entire information from the eye okay there's going to be absolutely no vision coming out of that eye okay nothing produced whereas the optic chiasm as i'm sure you're probably sick to death about hearing because it is very important but it's very labored um over you're going to have a, a bitemporal hormonous hemo hemo hemomyopia um sorry i can't say that very well because you still have the temporal fibers, but you don't have the nasal ones, OK? And pits. Probably you've heard about this. This is definitely an MCQ question, OK? You need to know this acronym, P-I-T-S. So um, if you have a quadrantopia, which is when a quadrant, so a quarter of the vision is not seen, um, because there are two radiations from the lateral denucleate bodies, so there's an inferior and an, a superior radiation. Oh, sorry, I clipped the screen. If there's an inferior quadrantopia, then you know that it's due to a lesion in the parietal lobe. But if there's a superior one, it's a lesion in the temporal lobe. OK, so that is an MCQ that I will guarantee will come up. So just learn the ac acronym. It's very important for clinical as well, but we're fo focusing on exams here. So what then happens? So we're going to talk about the organisation of the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is, as I've said, one of the, uh, the most important, arguably, radiation of um, <coughs> the uh, optic nerve um, via the retinofugal pathway. 
So the LGN, lateral geniculate nucleus, has segregated axons from each ganglion cell type into different layers, which allows for retinotopy and isolated processing of the different modalities of the visual system. OK, and these layers you can actually see in staining in the top right corner of the slide. So just to remind you, retinotopy is an organisation whereby retinal cells can feed information to neighbouring places about their target structures. And so in this way, a 2D surface of the retina can be mapped onto the 2D surface of subsequent structures. OK, so receptive field overlap, which is the image of a point of light on the re uh, retina, can then potentially activate every ne neuron that has that point in its receptive field. And this means that the activity eventually in the striate cortex is broad, but with a peak at the corresponding retinotopic location. So at each segregated layer, lesions, for example, at parvocellular layers, eliminates the colour vision and impairs visual acuity. And functionally, again, it's separated. So lesions at the magnocellular layers reduces the, inability, uh, the ability to detect fast moving visual stimuli. So acuity, for example, is therefore processed and conveyed by the parvocellular layers. So here we have this diagram that explains what cell type goes to what layer. OK, so I said that there's three. Um, uh, three targets of the um, optic nerve um, pathway. So here are the other two, the hypothalamus. So we know about circadian rhythms um, and how important they are. So obviously they're influenced by light. And the last one is to the pretactum, which can control um, pupil size and some eye movements. OK, and some of the ganglion cells do go to the superior colliculus, uh, which can help uh, with uh, orientation and movement of the eyes and movement of stimuli. OK, so we're going to focus, <laughs> excuse the pun, on acuity. So acuity is really important because firstly, there are essays about it, but also it really demonstrates several concepts, for example, lateral inhibition, spatial summation, point spread and optic blur. And these things can be applied to every single um, visual essay and can basically underpins the idea of vision. OK, so resolution is what we're talking about with acuity, the ability to define two adjacent points to be separate. So it's basically a measure of how good and how accurate your vision is. It's dependent on three things, the optics, so the ability to refract light accurately, the density of the retinal receptors and neural processing. And so either the addition or retention of um, information or the merging and uh, loss of accuracy of information at processing level. So talking about optics, so Forget everything about the pathways, etc. We're just going to think about a beam of light hitting a photoreceptor. So thinking about stars, so optical blur, always think about stars. They're so far away that they can be regarded as infinite, infinitely small point sources of light. OK, so now real world experiment, we're not having a single photon being emitted by a weird photon gun thing. We're going to just use stars instead as our stimulus. So the retinal image of a star will not be a single point. OK, so it's not going to go one star to one cone receptor because the optics will spread out the light in a sort of heap on the retina. OK, so you can see two heaps, two point spread functions on that figure just there to the right. So this distribution of light is the point spread function and is a measure of the optic quality. Under the best possible conditions in the human eye, the point spread function has a diameter of 1.5 mini arc and can determine what sort of patterns we see. So if there are two stars, as you can see in that figure, they can be seen as two separate stars if they meet Rayleigh's criterion. So two stars closer together, which is the figure right there, will have overlap point spread function, so overlap activity. And so there won't be separation, so they will not be seen as two separate stars. OK, so just to slightly elaborate on that, you can think of each peak wave. So each wave there 
representing, let's say hypothetically, this is how I think of it, the y-axis here is like activity of the photoreceptor and the x-axis you can think of as like a direct map of like a line of receptors on the retina. So as you go geographically across the retina, the peak shows at which point what photoreceptor has the highest amount of activity. And so if there's overlap of these receptor fields of activity, then it's going to be very difficult to distinguish what is triggering it because there's overlap. Whereas if you have two distinct point spread functions, so two distinct pieces of activity, let's say on the left and right borders of the eye, really extreme, you're then going to see two different separate stimuli, so two separate different stars. So receptors and acuity are really important and they also determine um, accuracy of vision and acuity. So physically, if you have a stimulus and it can't activate a single receptor um, because the receptors are so tightly packed and so much smaller than the actual stimulus, so that star, then you're not going to see the star necessarily as one star or two stars or three stars because, again, the receptor fields overlap because the activation of the receptors are overlapping. OK, so there was an experiment by Klein to see if the spacing of the cones in the um, fovea and mac forgive me, in the, um, in the macula, um, in the entire uh, retina, forgive me, um, was spaced out enough to see specific um, images or if there were so many that the density allowed for smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller gaps to be resolved. OK, so they found basically the conclusion is that oh, um, there is a blind spot mm. and at the phobia there's the highest amount of um, cone density and that enables for the highest amount of acuity at the phobia. So nothing we didn't already know. But moving, using this as a foundation, Green and Campbell in 1965 then found that at the fovea, they used this special image, which is very similar to a Snellen chart, to then identify if the actual optics of the eye was able to uh, create how many, for example, degrees of acuity. So they found that their unit was cycles per degree, so it was 60, whatever. So it was a high amount of acuity. Other works? again found higher acts but basic based on the initial experiment um the max 60 cycles is possible with the eye however we don't have 60 cycles per degree it doesn't matter what the unit is um let's say the top is a 60 out of 100 or whatever we don't have that because we're we're disadvantaged by the optics of the eye and then again by post receptor neural processing takes away from acuity okay so the takeaway message from these experiments you know you can bend it whatever way you want again sorry about the pun but um basically it says that the eye is very well designed for acuity is very well designed for this accurate vision but our brain hasn't really caught up with the the evolution of our eye and the optics of our eye can one become degraded over time or two not match this um, photoreceptor density so then it takes away from this max security that we could achieve if we were only looking at the eye itself okay so this brings on to spatial summation so this is just talking again about the optics of the eye so you need to remember that all of this is based on physics unfortunately and at some point for example now we're going to introduce a small equation don't panic about it it makes a great paragraph in your essays to talk about, but also really expresses quite easily about the idea of um, the convergence, etc., from stimulus to cells to neurons to then processing. So st spatial summation describes the eye's ability to summate or add up quanta over a certain area. So the area of which spatial summation occurs over is called the critical diameter. So Rico's law, which is L times A to the power of N equals K, says that a threshold is reached when total luminous energy reaches a constant value, which is K. OK, so the threshold is the product of luminance times stimulus area. To the power of spatial summation, so if spatial summation is completed, it's N. If it's partial, 
then it's between zero and one. So no spatial summation can occur therefore if n equals zero and critical value can vary with eccentricity. Spatial summation occurs due to convergence of photoreceptors onto ganglions. This convergence of photoreceptors forms a receptor field, thus stimulating different photoreceptors within this receptor field um, would result in one signal. Receptor field sizes varies with eccentricity and helps to explain why the critical area itself varies with eccentricity. And this was said by Shapley in 1984. So the size of the spatial summation, so the functional receptor field, will limit re resolution capabilities as outlined earlier. So with scotopic vision, the cones don't have sufficient sensitivity, and so vision is subserved, subserved by rods, whose spatial resolution is much lower due to the spatial summation of rods. So the number of rods that merge into a bipolar cell that in turn connects to the ganglion cell and results in a resolution um, which is quite large, but acuity is quite small. So, summation, so spatial summation, you can think of it as a measure, a concept of the um, merging of data via this convergence of, of cells. OK. And here we go. This convergence is a receptor field. We've talked about receptor fields. Think about that frog eating the fly. So the last concept that we're going to talk about in terms of this, um, the, the processing, subcortical processing of vision is lateral inhibition. So I never got lateral inhibition when I was in second year until I saw this particular diagram. Um, so inhibition, you know, is important. So you've probably come across of it in, for example, touch sensation. So it's not a useful for us to always have constant 100% of stimulus bombarding us all the time at a conscious level, okay? Because we need to focus to stimulus changing, we need to focus to um, what is important and what is rather than what's not important. So rods becoming stimulated by energy from light and releasing, let's say, an excitatory neural signal to the horizontal cells will only be translated to rod cells in the centre of the ganglion cell receptor field to ganglion cells because horizontal cells respond by sending inhibitory signals to neighbouring rods to create a balance that allows mammals to perceive more vivid images. So this was discovered by Stevens in 2014. So a central rod that will send the light signals directly to the bipolar cells, so that middle one, B, will in turn relay a signal to the ganglion cells. The centre surround organisation of receptor fields and gang of ganglion cells and bipolar cells is created by this lateral inhibitory connection provided by the horizontal and amacrine cells. So if B, is stimu B stimulates the, the corresponding photoreceptor, etc. Um, and then that excitatory signal is, is moved on forward that ganglion cell <coughs> sorry that horizontal and amacrine cell associated with it will then inhibit the neighboring photoreceptors so that they don't send that excitatory signal forward too so lateral inhibition in a way conquers the issue of this um receptor field overlap okay at a very very minute level so amacrine cells produce lateral inhibition to bipolar cells and ganglion cells to perform various visual computations, which includes image sharpening. And in this scenario, um, but this scenario is quite rare, OK, as cones may connect to both midget and diffuse flat bipolar cells and amacrines and horizontal cells can merge messes, messages as easily as inhibit them. So the final visual signals will then be sent to the thalamus and the cortex, where then additional lateral inhibition occurs, okay? So it's not just at the level of the photoreceptors. At every single level, an activated neuron can send back signals to inhibit its initial stimulus detectors that's adjacent to them, okay? Either functionally or anatomically. So let's just move past, you know, the... Um, 
neurons involved, the nervous systems and cells. And we're going to just look at the concept of higher processing. So vision is constructive, right? So we don't see a whole image and just know, OK, that's a cow. We see different elements of it and then our brain fills in the rest and we see pattern recognition and therefore have this saliency okay so we see uniform six by six dots as columns or rows because of the brain's tendency to impose a pattern if the dots in each row are similar we're more likely to see a pattern of alternating rows so you can see that in figure a if the columns are closer together then we're more likely to see a column in figures uh, b the principle of good continu continuation is important for linking line elements into uniform shapes. It's also seen in the phenomenon of contour saliency, whereby smooth contours tend to pop out from backgrounds. So you can think about this, it makes sense functionally. So when we're in the jungle and we're looking at our predator, we're more likely to see the smooth back of a jaguar leaping out to eat us than the individual leaf, okay? So segmentation doesn't rely on only geometric principles, though, but also cognitive influences such as attention and expectation. So again, we're in the jungle. We are anticipating for our predators. We are looking out for our predators. Therefore, we're more likely to see our predators. So a priming stimulus or internal representation of an object shape can facilitate the association of visual elements into a unified percept. OK. So just briefly, there are three levels of vision anal analysis, OK, and it's very, very complex. So it's I'm very sorry, it's not something that we can go over in an hour's worth of a lecture. And I've been told that you've been extensively taught about higher processing. But here you can see some of the pathways that are involved with it. And you can imagine if there's any sort of lesion, for example, a stroke, either ischemic or hemorrhagic, or uh, an expanding uh, space occupied lesion, for example, tumour, you can see how these pathways can become obliterated and then affect different aspects of vision. OK, so um, we're going to move on to hearing, uh, especially because it's now 35 minutes into this lecture. So here's an ear. I hope you guys recognise that. That's pretty much as much anatomy as you're going to need for a second year. Um, so remember there's two types of hearing okay so it's all via the same mechanism but there's sensory neural and there's conductor so through bone and through nerve so Rinnie's and Reba's test helps with the um to distinguish conductive hearing loss versus sensory neural hearing loss so it's all involving a tuning fork and it's very complicated so basically you just hit the tuning fork, you either put it next to the person's ear or on their head like a unicorn horn. OK, so sorry, the saying it was very complicated was sarcastic and it probably doesn't translate, in, translate well over teams. But Rinnie's, so the normal response is that air is louder than bone. So that's Rinnie positive. With conductive hearing loss, bone is louder than air, Rinnie's negative. And sensory neural hearing loss, air is louder than bone. With weavers, the sound heard in the midline is normal. Sound heard in bad ear is conductive, and sound heard in good ear is hearing a uh, sensory neural hearing loss. So you use both tests together to determine clinically whether it's sensory neural or conductive hearing loss. Okay. So we're also going to go just over briefly the preventative strategies and ear replacements um, that you can have, uh, but because we can do something clinically, it's that kind of highlights the functional importance of why we need to understand about hearing. And, and you know, is a direct, really nice direct example from preclinical to clinical, where something you learn about actually you can do something about and you can fix based on your preclinical knowledge, if that makes sense. OK, I lied. Here's some more anatomy. Um, you really don't need to know how to draw these things. You don't need to really know that much about it. At least I didn't and I was fine, but please be familiar with it. OK, so ta-da, here's an ear. There's external, middle and internal. So the basilar membrane. So this is the structure that dominates hearing as a sensation. So it's a pseudo resonant structure that movements is described as a traveling wave first observed by Bexie with a dissected cadaver's inner ear. Yummy, huh? 
Um, so Bexy used show photography with Silverflakes' marker and was able to observe the traveling wave motion of the basilar membrane when stimulated by sound. So the basilar membrane acts as a mechanical filter bank that distinguishes different frequency components because most mechanical energy of a sound wave will travel the path of the least resistance. So the cochlea has two sources of resistance. So the stiffness of the basilar membrane and the inertia of the cochlear fluids. And this is graded along the cochlea running in opposite directions, okay? So as inertial resistance is frequency dependent, the path of overall re lowest resistance depends on the frequency, long for low fre frequencies, which is less affected by inertia. The path is shorter for higher frequencies. This results in each point of the basilar membrane having a frequency that will vibrate, make it vibrate more than any other, which we call the best frequency. And this allows the cochlea to operate as a mechanical frequency anal analyzer and able to create tonotopic representations of a sound wave. So because of this, the cochlea has been described as a Fourier analyzer. And the best frequency means that the, this mechanism can derive the frequency composition of the sound using the organ of Corti. You should really, 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 really always go to bed with this lesson at night, that there's no direct or causal relationship between the cochlear place code and the perception of pitch, despite this best frequency concept, okay? So moving from the conceptual level, let's just talk about the transduction of the stimulus. So there's a high concentration of potassium in the scalar media's endolymph that's created by the stria vascularis, okay? And it's trapped by the Reisner's membrane to provide an endocochlear potential of about 80 millivolts. This potential is key, okay? We know this because with age, the stria vascularis is less able to produce potassium ions, and this causes metabolic presbyacusis. So metabolic presbyacusis is frequency dependent hearing loss, and this first deletes high frequencies and also affects the ability to understand speech and recognizes voices. In the voice, there are lots of different harmonics and losing the ability, uh, this means that you lose the ability to hear speech completely. It's really easy to underestimate the necessity of hearing, okay? But with the elderly people who unfortunately are most um, afflicted with this metabolic presbyacusis, hearing is such a grounding social influence on someone's life. And it can actually, um, loss of hearing can precipitate dementia. It can make um, lots of kind of cognitive impairments worse and also really isolates an old person, okay? So it brings, brings in a lot of concepts from your second year course and first year course of like the sociology and the, the health on old age and the impact of socialization and just, you know, interaction with the environment and how important it is to keep the plasticity of our brain alive, okay? We've sort of just talked about the potassium, but how does this actually affect the hair cells? So the stereocilia on top of hair cells, which you can see in the figure, are connected at the tips by protein fibre strands, and these are called tip links. So pushing the cell bundle to the longest stereocilium will cause the tension on the tip links, and pushing the other direction will release this tension. The tip links are connected at one or both ends to stretch activated iron channels and allow potassium and some calcium to enter the hair cell and depolarize it. So what, what evidence, because we're in second year, we're adding this experimental evidence to say that this tension leads to the transduction channel activity. Well, I'm glad you asked that. There are kind of three levels of, of uh, evidence. So firstly, the bundle is stiffer along the axis of symmetry, suggesting that portion of work done to deflect the bundle of stereocilia goes into the gated springs, which are also called the tip links. The second supporting evidence is the rapid speed at which the channels open, okay? And also that the electrical response of these hair cells um, favor a kinetic scheme whereby mechanical energy is responsible for depolarization. So with each cycle of vibration of the basilar membrane can cause a corresponding cycle of increasing and decreasing tension on tip links. The larger the deflection of the stereocilia, the greater quantity of K plus channels are open Therefore, the greater the current allowing for accurate transduction of sound intensities. OK, so where do these hair cells go? Well, they form glutamergic excitatory um, synaptic contacts with neurons of the spiral ganglion. Um, and 
Fatal information transfer at the hair cell afferent synapse requires synaptic transmission to be both reliable and temporally precise. The release of glutamate, therefore, must be uh, exhibit both rapid on and rapid off um, kinetics to accurately follow acoustic stimuli with periodicity of one millisecond or less. OK, so because of this, there are some anatomical changes. The synapse is um, characterized by the presence of a large presynaptic organelle called the synaptic rib ribbon or the dense body. Um, and this tethers the synaptic these cause and is itself anchored to the active zone of the synapse. So unlike the conventional synapse that's driven by action potentials, the hair cell afferent synapse responds to graded changes in the membrane potential and so can encode sounds of extremely different intensities. Additionally, the cochlear hair cell afferent synapse must also be able to encode prolonged ever present sounds. To meet this requirement, the ribbon synapse allows for sustained glutamate release that can be maintained by extensive synaptic vesicle cycling, both um, vesical exo and endocytosis and depot of vesicles. Okay. The spiral ganglion then in turn forms really long axons that travel through the auditory branch of the vestibular cochlear cranial nerve, terminating at the cochlear nucleus. The more deflection, the more glutamate is released, and it's um, assumed that type 1 fibres uh, provide this fast throughput of uh, detailed information requiring for the acute sense of hearing when they receive input from a single hair cell that um, with each hair cell forming a ribbon synapse with approximately 20 fibres. So the unmyelinated outer hair cells connect to six fibres each, sharing fibres with about 10 other outer hair cells. So with the outer hair cells, we have convergence that reduces specificity and the um, unmyelination also confers uh, slow conduction okay so it's a less accurate pathway so let's just briefly talk about the adaptation of hair cells so adaptation compensates overall for developmental irregularities but also environmental changes by adjusting gating springs so that transduction channels are able are active at the bundle's resting position so adaptation enables the hair to maintain high sensitivity to transient stimuli whilst ignoring larger static sounds. Hair cell adaptation is characterized as decrease in receptor potential during prolonged deflection and loses about 20% sensitivity to stimulation though. So the process involves adjustment to the tension of the, of the tip links, potentially due to an insertional plaque. So there are several dozen myosin 1C associated with each tip link and insertional plaques, which are thought to maintain tension by ascending cytoskeletal actin filaments and um, pulling the link insertion with them. It's thought that the calcium then accumulates in the stereocilia cytoplasm and the iron binds to calmodulin light chains, activating them, causing them to reduce the upward force in the myosin 1C molecule and therefore shortening the gated spring. So when the spring reaches resting tension, the calcium channels close, allowing homeostasis between the upward myosin force and the downward tension. So what's important to remember here, because there's a lot of notes on the slides, is that calcium goes to adaptation, whereas potassium predominantly goes to just the ability to transduct the sounds. OK. So now we've talked about adaptation. Let's just talk about amplification, which in a way is a form of adaptation. So the outer hair cells, we've talked about how they're a bit rubbish about having um, High, high tuning and how they're not very good because they've had fibre convergence, so less accurate. But they do enable cochlear amplification that probably does contribute to the high sensitivity and fine tuning frequency selectivity of the inner hair cells, as these features are lost when the outer hair cells are selectively damaged by aminoglycoside antibiotics. So the outer hair cells unique protein, Prestin, allows for this ability. So it allows the outer hair cells to contract to about 4% of their length extremely rapidly, shown by knockout cells of knockout Preston. So these very small and fast movements provide mechanical amplification of vibrations produced with modulation provided by the descending olivocochlear bundle. With each cycle of the basilar membrane vibration, the outer hair cells stereocilia are deflected, causing their membrane potential to depolarize, 
and their cells to contract. This then causes the basilar membrane to move more, allowing the outer house hair cell to be dipolarized and contract further. This feed forward cycle adds to substantial mechanical energy to weak vibrations of the basilar membrane, so enables hearing at a wide range of sound intensities. Okay. Amplification gain is then altered by efferent, uh, altered by efferent uh, cell bodies in the superior olivary complex that form inhibitory synapse on the outer hair cells. So this reduces the sensitivity of type 1 afferents to um, as sound pressure levels increase. So we're just going to talk very briefly um, about the coding of sounds uh, before just finishing up with the cochlear implants. So how is frequency um, coded? Well, Firing rate of type 1 fibres is dependent on glutamate release, as we've discussed earlier. Therefore, firing rate of spiral ganglia cells reflect amplitude of vibration of their path of the basilar membrane. Each type 1 fibre exhibits both dynamic and static responses plotted in tuning curves, which, is show, which show that they um, are sharply turned at low sound pressure levels. And the unit is most sensitive to a specific frequency called the characteristic frequency. And this enables tonotopic mapping of as afferents with successfully, uh, successively, not successfully, um, lower characteristic frequencies are found closer to the cochlear apex. So for low frequencies, coding is um, <coughs> coding uses the property that afferent fire with the greatest probability during the particular phase of sound um, is phase locking. So with phase locking, if different groups of the cell phase lock onto different parts of the cycle, then the whole population of cells acting in concert then can encode frequency. The pattern of vibration on the basilar membrane is translated into neural rate place code. So to support this model of rate place code is recordings of mechanical vibrations of basilar membrane and the evoked auditory nerve fiber discharges using both extracellular recordings of spiral ganglions and laser vibrometer recordings of the same patch of the basilar membrane. So they closely follow each other. And that was Ruggiero 2000. It should be noted that phase locking is stochastic, so that we need to emphasize that residual randomness can arise because nerve fibers can skip cycles and because their firing is not precisely time locked onto the crest of the wave. But if one nerve fiber skips a particular cycle of sound stimulus, Another neighbouring fibre might mark it with a nerve impulse, which enables the auditory nerve to encode temporal fine structures at frequencies up to a few um, kilohertz, which is the Volley principle. How is sound intensity coded? Well, there's a relationship which is linear between sound pressure and firing rate of cochlear nerve fibres. So that implies that sound pressure is logarithmically encoded by neuronal activity. Very intense sounds will saturate. So within the nerve fibers of the same characteristic frequency, there are accurate uh, axons with different thresholds, which allows for accurate processing of loudness of the same stimuli. So the most sensitive thresholds are approximately zero decibels and have saturation response about 40. Um, so that allows for very accurate and very wide range um, of intensity sound um, recognition. So then they ribbon synapse with the um, inter inner hair cells nearest to the axis of the cochlear spiral. And the least sensitive afferent has a less spontaneous, act uh, spontaneous activity and much higher th thresholds. OK, so all of this allows for a huge amount of range and pattern of response. So how is pitch um, encoded? Well, pitch is also known as periodicity, OK, which sometimes, well, it confused me at least because of music. I was like, well, pitch is like this, it's different, it's different pitches, but it's please use the words periodicity. I was always told off for using pitch. Um, so pitch is extremely stable variations. Um, Pitch is extremely stable to other variations. So no matter how loud a pitch is, it's still the same pitch. So it's fairly independent on spatial location, sound level and relative levels of harmonics composing it. So periodicity is the most important determinant of pitch of a sound, which is SHNUP 2007, and is quantified by the fundamental frequency. So the number of times the period repeats itself in one second. 
Periodicity is encoded in the subcortical auditory pathways by temporal patterns of spikes. A periodic sound elicits spike patterns in which interspike intervals are equally uh, are equal to the period of sound. Sorry. Phase locking here again is key because it allows a periodic waveform to create a pattern of spike times that repeats itself, at least on average, on every period of the sound. So the firing pattern responding to periodic waveforms are periodic. So reading the fundamental frequency from temporal structures of the auditory nerve fibre response is possible, shown by Cariani and Delgata of 1996, by using recorded responses of auditory nerve fibres with different best frequencies. So then they used a variation of autocorrelation to extract the fundamental frequency. Okay, so moving away from all of this encoding of sound and therefore processing of sound, how can we piggyback on nature to enable other people to hear if they don't have, um, for example, hair cells? So patients can be deaf due to extensive damage of the hair cells, um, and there's currently no method to regenerate or repair these cells. Okay. And when hair cells are lost in auditory nerve fibres that normally connect them, these nerve fibres actually degenerate themselves. OK, so it seems that auditory nerve fibres need to be in contact with hair cells to stay healthy. Outer hair cells damage um, could lead to no amplification and then the remaining inner hair cells could be incapable of prov providing sensitive hearing but survive and can keep the type 1 auditory nerve fibres they're connected to alive. We can bypass the hair cells because they're basically the receptors, right? By just directing, directly stimulating auditory nerve fibres with cochlear implants. But you need to remember that surgical placement, therefore, is really crucial due to anatomical proximity of firstly other cranial nerves, which can lead to very unpleasant and painful twitching of the face, but also because of this um, tonotopic pattern of hearing. So an implant is an intracochlear electrode that's threaded into the cochlea via the round window or a small hole drilled, uh, drilled into the bony shell of the cochlea next to it. Okay, The electrode gets electrical signals from a receiver device, which you can think of as a, as a uh, microphone, which then signals via an induction coil to form a radio transmitter, um, that is, um, and the receiver held onto the scalp via magnets. So the transmitter coil is connected to a speech processor, which then collects the sound in the environment via a microphone and encodes them into an appropriate electrical signal, signal to send to the subcut receiver. So via these electrode contacts, the cochlear implants aims to trigger a pattern of activity in the auditory nerve fibres, which resembles as much as possible the activity that would occur naturally with the synaptic inputs from the hair cells if the organ of cortical was functional. And therefore, it is based on mimicking this tonotopicity created by the basal membrane's resistant gradients, activating the specific hair cells in a functional ear. OK, so there is some obviously some drawbacks. Firstly, aesthetic. But most of um, most of the time, these cochlear implants are implanted um, in children as babies or as very young. Um, so, you know, they grow up with it and with children, they're very adaptable. They think that that is how it's always been for them. Therefore, they don't really find an issue. Um, but there are some issues, for example, the lack of temporal fine structure um, information about the sound. So periodicity mostly means that implantees can't appreciate pitch. So periodicity, um, so musical melody, but they can appreciate musical rhythm. There's currently experimental trials on improving temporal information by increasing the signal's depth of modulation. So potentially the lower limit of periodicity pitch achieved with the electrical stimulation in, in comparison uh, with those obtained with acoustic click trains in the normal ear is hypersynchronization. So it's possible that the physiology, physiology of the ribbon synapses may favour asynchronous activation and the electro's current pulses being large and far away leads to a high synchronised activation, making it impossible for the auditory nerve to rely on the volley principle to encode the high pulse rates, hence no music. So the recordings of implanted animals show that highly precise time locking to every pulse of a pulse train and its inability to lock higher rates than a few hertz um, shows that hypersynchronisation may be the limiting factor. 
So therefore technical solutions are actually way off and these people may not be able to hear music very soon. Even though there have already been attempts to introduce some sort of stochastic resonance to decrease the activity, um, the hypersynchronous activity of the auditory nerve fibers, but these haven't produ produced significant results. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm sorry I run slightly longer. You have two minutes to have a look at these MCQs, um, and I have the answers also in the handouts. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, the MCQs are in the handouts if you uh, fill out the feedback, which I'd really appreciate. Um, and good luck for your exams, I guess.